Goals 2000, a federal government education policy in place, aims to bring every school and every school district and every state into conformity with politically prescribed standards of what should be learned by every child. What are these politically prescribed standards? For a clue, let's look to Enid Lee, an educator hired in many school districts to lead workshops seeking to eliminate, quote, the national cultures and literatures of white Western peoples, unquote, and erase, quote, their very identity and historical existence, unquote. Her and her colleagues aim is to revise history so it doesn't portray America as a, quote, historically white majority country whose population and institutions emerged from Britain and Europe, unquote. By this government-backed multicultural curriculum, educators teach they, themselves, their families, their descendants, and society as a whole are inherently prejudiced and unjustified in any individual or national accomplishment. After years of this form of sensitivity training, or better put, brainwashing, students are more inclined to denigrate Western civilization, American history, and in particular, the white race, in the name of compassionate multiculturalism. Is it possible to mix science with a belief in God? Aren't they as incompatible as oil and water? After all, the prevailing notion taught by the academic establishment today is that truly scientific minds don't fall for the nonsense of religion. Well, it turns out that forcing science and Christianity into isolation from one another is a fairly recent invention. In fact, the founders of modern science actually used their devout faith in biblical Christianity as a springboard. Kepler, for instance, the father of physical astronomy, believed, quote, only and alone in the service of Jesus Christ, in him is all refuge and solace. Kepler, a household name even today for his laws of planetary motion that provided the basis for Newtonian physics, wrote, Quote, since we astronomers are priests of the highest God in regard to the book of nature, it befits us to be thoughtful, not of the glory of our minds, but rather above all else, of the glory of God. No stranger to theological skepticism, even in the 15th century, Kepler debated an atheist colleague by telling him a model of the solar system he had constructed, quote, just happened. A strong wind must have come in and blown around laboratory debris, dust, and other particles from outside. Somehow, this elaborate model is the result. Following the atheist colleague's incredulous retort, Kepler offered a creative defense of Christianity that still resonates today. Quote, yet you're willing to believe that the actual solar system, with its unspeakable complexities, simply created itself. Now that is ridiculous. More recent looks at the solar system have yielded the same conclusion. An actual rocket scientist, Dr. Werner von Braun, the leading founder of the American space program, wrote, quote, As I became exposed to the law and order of the universe, I was literally humbled by its unerring perfection. I became convinced that there must be a divine intent behind it all. My experiences with science led me to God. As a result of von Braun's work on moon missions, the Apollo project was launched and astronauts Jim Lovell, Frank Borman, and William Anders were the first men in history to circle the moon in 1968. There, they proclaimed the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When challenged by a Soviet cosmonaut who sarcastically stated he didn't see God in space, Frank Borman responded, quote, I did not see him either, but I saw his evidence. Jack Louisma, another astronaut, wrote, quote, If I can't believe that the spacecraft I fly assembled itself, how can I believe that the universe assembled itself? I'm convinced only an intelligent God could have built a universe like this. And Robert Boyle knew some 400 years ago that the order of the universe reflected God's purposeful design. Boyle was arguably the founder of modern chemistry and a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. He wrote, our Savior would love at no less rate than death, and from the supereminent height of glory, stooped and debased himself to the sufferance of the extremest of indignities, and sunk himself to the bottom of abjectness to exalt our condition to the contrary extreme. 
Boyle's faith and scientific career were integrated. He was active in financially supporting the spread of Christianity. His enduring legacy includes an endowment left in his will for an annual lectureship to combat atheism. These Boyle lectures are still held every year. William Thompson Kelvin, the founder of thermodynamics, perhaps best known for his discovery of the second law of thermodynamics. Today, this law is a major tenet, proving evolution false. Science positively affirms creative power, Kelvin said, and it, quote, is not in dead matter that we live and move and have our being, but in the creating and directing power which science compels us to accept as an article of belief. Kelvin is also responsible for the laying of the first cable across the Atlantic Ocean in 1858. He used this amazing device to send a clear message about God. In the first wire, he said, quote, Europe and America are united by telegraphic communication. Glory to God in the highest. On earth, peace, goodwill towards men. Samuel Morse invented the telegraph. How did he do it? Well, while at a standstill in his work, Morse prayed for more light, and his prayer was answered. He credited God, saying, quote, I had made a valuable application of the use of electrical power, but it was all through God's help. It wasn't because I was superior to other scientists. When the Lord wanted to bestow this gift on mankind, he had to use someone. I'm just grateful he chose to reveal it to me. Morse's first message over the telegraph, quote, What hath God wrought? Possibly unthinkable to Kelvin and Morse is the idea that humans could simply fly across the Atlantic Ocean and deliver their own messages swiftly. Of course, we have the inventors and Christians, Wilbur and Orville Wright, to thank for designing the first airplane to take flight in 1903. These brothers lived during a time when virtually all scientists and inventors, from America's inception through most of the 20th century, shared their faith. Their peers included John Ambrose Fleming, co-founder of Electronics, who claimed the Bible, quote, is and always has been revered as the communication to use from the creator of the universe, the supreme and everlasting God. Another contemporary was Joseph Lister, founder of antiseptic surgery. Lister left no room for speculation in stating, quote, I'm a believer in the fundamental doctrines of Christianity. But let's go back to the Atlantic Ocean, the setting of yet another great scientist's most notable work. Matthew Morey, the founder of oceanography and hydrography, started his career as a U.S. Navy officer. An accident forced him to leave active duty after 36 years at sea, but he remained motivated by the words of Psalm 8-8 regarding the paths in the seas. He charted the winds and currents of the Atlantic to confirm that the sea did indeed have paths, and went on to write oceanography's first modern textbook, The Physical Geography of the Sea. Morey stated, quote, I have always found in my scientific studies that when I could get the Bible to say anything on the subject, it afforded me a firm platform to stand upon. The Bible called the earth the round world, and finally sailors circumnavigated the globe, and as for the general system of circulation which I have been so long endeavoring to describe, the Bible tells it all in a single sentence. The wind goeth toward the south, and returneth again to his circuits. We all recognize the name Isaac Newton, considered one of the greatest scientists who ever lived. Even beyond his famous moment beneath a fruit tree where he began exploring the universal laws of gravitation, he also anticipated the law of energy conservation, formulated the three laws of motion, developed the particle theory of light propagation, and invented the reflecting telescope. Newton also firmly believed in Jesus Christ as his Savior and in the Bible as God's Word. He wrote, quote, The most beautiful system of sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as Lord over all. A little known fact, Newton actually wrote more books and letters on the topic of theology than any other subject, including his scientific studies. Some 200 years later, a Christian named Louis Pasteur dedicated his life to studying bacteria and germs. Now known as the founder of bacteriology, Pasteur is credited with protecting millions of people through vaccinations, solving the mysteries of rabies, anthrax, chicken cholera, and silkworm diseases, and developing the pasteurization process we still use to destroy bacteria in milk, cider, and other foods. 
Despite these amazing advances, Pasteur was unpopular with the scientific establishment of his day because he persistently objected to the evolutionary theory and worked to debunk many of its key tenets. So why was he so different from his peers? Pasteur explained it himself, saying, quote, A little science estranges men from God, but much science leads them back to him. And Pasteur was not alone in his beliefs in the early 19th century. Other godly men were making huge breakthroughs in science with him, including Michael Faraday, the founder of electromagnetics. Faraday invented the electrical generator, pioneered the liquefaction of gases, discovered electrolysis, the concept of magnetic lines of force, and more. Still, he found more value in his faith, saying, quote, Therefore, brethren, we ought to value the privilege of knowing God's truth far beyond anything we can have in this world. Other contemporaries cited God as the source for their varied scientific inquiries. James Clerk Maxwell, who formulated the electromagnetic theory of light, said, quote, I believe that man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The founders of modern atomic theory, comparative anatomy, and computer science were all Christians. And Henri Jean Fabre, the founder of modern entomology, asserted, quote, Without him, I understand nothing. Without him, all is darkness. As for the rising tide of atheism in science, Fabre said, quote, Every period had its manias. I regard atheism as a mania. It is the malady of the age. You could take my skin from me more easily than my faith in God. All the way back to the 16th century, when Francis Bacon invented the scientific method still used today, the connection was strong. Bacon said, quote, There are two books laid before us to study, to prevent our falling into error. First, the volume of the scriptures which reveal the will of God, then the volume of the creatures, which express his power. God's creatures were the focus of a lifetime of study by Carolus Linnaeus, the founder of taxonomy and biological classification. He believed, quote, You live in your forests as the birds, whom neither sow nor reap, but whom the Almighty God nonetheless supplies abundantly with sustenance. Actually, God's awesome creation has inspired many scientists over the centuries. When he looked into the stars, Sir William Herschel saw not just an unknown planet, Uranus, but also a loving God. The undevout astronomer must be mad, he concluded. John Ray looked around the Earth, and the founder of English and natural history marveled at, quote, the works created by God at first and by him conserved to this day. And more recently, George Washington Carver discovered more than 300 products derived from the simple peanut, as well as other products from clay. Carver was born into slavery and raised with very limited financial means. Still, he became one of the most renowned scientists simply because he marveled at the wonder of God's creation. Carver said, quote, I love to think of nature as wireless telegraph stations through which God speaks to us every day, every hour, and every moment of our lives. And the original story of creation motivated James Simpson, the founder of anesthesiology. Genesis tells us God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep and then took a rib from his side to create Eve. Simpson used this inspiration to develop chloroform and later introduced iron wire sutures and acupressure to the world. Simpson also worked to spread the good news. A gospel tract he wrote concludes, quote, But again I saw and saw Jesus by substitute, scourged in my stead and dying on the cross for me. I looked and cried and was forgiven. And it seems to be my duty to tell you of that Savior, to see if you will also not look and live. And perhaps the connection between the creator and his creation was summed up best by Louis Agassiz, the founder of glaciology, when he wrote, quote, In our study of natural objects, we are approaching the thoughts of the creator, reading his conceptions, interpreting a system that is his and not ours. Blaise Pascal, an early mathematician who laid the foundation for the modern fields of hydrostatics, hydrodynamics, differential calculus, and the study of probability, became a devout Christian at age 31. He's most remembered for mathematical principles like Pascal's triangle and for helping to develop the barometer. But he personally felt the most important discovery of his life was his savior, Jesus Christ. Pascal said of his conversion, quote, I submit myself wholly to Jesus Christ, my Savior, and later wrote, Except by Jesus Christ, we know not what life is, what our death is, what God is, what we ourselves are. Without Jesus Christ, man must be in sin and misery. With Jesus Christ, man is exempt from sin and misery. In him, 
is all our virtue and our felicity. Another mathematician, Leonard Euler, advocated the combination of faith and science even when it put his life at risk. Euler, the founder of analysis and designer of many math symbols we still use today, stood his ground against major opponents like Frederick II, King of Prussia, and the king's best friend, French philosopher Voltaire. But that was only the beginning. During Euler's lifetime, he suffered the loss of his wife, his home burning to the ground, and an eye infection that left him in excruciating pain. How did he overcome these hardships? Only my faith in God enables me to bear it, he said. When the infection finally cleared, Euler was left totally blind, but he went on to solve some of the most difficult problems of mathematics on the blackboard of his mind, dictating solutions to friends. The list of Christian scientists certainly isn't limited to mathematicians. A wide variety of fields were founded by godly men, including statigraphy, a branch of geology, genetics, and mineralogy. And, though his name has been slandered in recent years, Leonardo da Vinci was a Christian whose art and scientific achievements are, some five centuries after his earthly existence, still appreciated and studied. Da Vinci was an innovator in experimental science, physics, and renowned painter of the famous Mona Lisa. And where did da Vinci get his inspiration? He said, quote, O oh Lord, thou givest everything at the price of an effort. A more contemporary Christian scientist, Thomas Edison, is credited with more inventions than we have time to list. The incandescent light bulb, the mimeograph and phonograph, and the first talking moving picture all came from his mind and companies. In 1928, Edison received the Congressional Gold Medal for development and application of inventions that have revolutionized civilization in the last century. Edison's many endeavors started with inquiries into God's creation. For example, while searching for a material from which to make electric light filaments, Edison said, quote, Somewhere in God Almighty's workshop is dense, woody growth with fibers almost geometrically parallel and with practically no pith from which we can make the filament the world needs. From 14th century Europe through the Enlightenment and into the Space Age, the founders of modern science were students of God's word in addition to God's world. Their frame of reference superseded mere observation, and as a result, they were granted a remarkable ability to connect the dots. Their aim was ultimately to discover more about the Creator, not merely the creation. Light. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. That's seven and a half times around the Earth in one second. That is fast. A light year is the distance light travels in one year. Light years are one of the standard distance measurements in astronomy. St. Augustine said light, even though it passes through pollution, is not polluted. Light is pure. Light is constant. Light is life-giving. Without light, you have darkness. Darkness and death go together. Light and life go together. Light can dispel darkness and always will. Darkness cannot dispel light. God is light. The Word of God, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you, that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Isaiah 60, verse 19, The sun shall be no more thy light by day, neither for brightness shall the moon give light unto thee. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. John 1, verse 4, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 1, verse 9, That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John 8, verse 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Seeds. Seeds are the tiny hard capsules from which most new plants grow. Seeds develop from the plant's egg once it is fertilized by pollen. 
Each seed contains the new plant in embryo form, plus a store of food to feed it until it grows leaves. The seed is wrapped in a hard shell known as a testa. Some fruit contain many seeds. Nuts are fruit with a single seed in which the outside has gone hard. After maturing, seeds go into a state called dormancy. While they are dormant, the seeds are scattered and dispersed. Some scattered seeds fall on barren ground and never grow into plants. Only those seeds that fall in suitable places will begin to grow. The world's biggest tree, the giant redwood, grows from a tiny seed that is less than two millimeters long. From one watermelon seed grows a watermelon plant with a delicious watermelon fruit. Within the fruit, there's hundreds of watermelon seeds, which came from the one seed. The Word of God, Matthew 13, verse 18, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that receiveth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word, and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Geese. A flock of geese fly in winged formation. How they know how to do this is because God put it into geese to do this instinctively. In fact, much of what scientists have learned in the area of flight has been gathered by studying birds. By flying in formation, geese can travel much farther than traveling in individual flying patterns. The one downside of flying in a wing formation is that the leader of the flock bears the brunt of air resistance. The leader during a long flight will therefore need to be relieved and switch places with other geese to get a needed rest. A lesson learned, we too should be concerned about our leader's well-being and help them if we can. The geese also fly in team. When they speak, they honk. What they're doing is encouraging one another. In essence, they're saying to their leaders in the front who can't see those behind them, we're still with you. We're behind you all the way. Keep at it. A lesson learned, we should each do his part while fulfilling our God-given role as we travel through life's journey. When a goose in a flock gets sick or injured, it is never left alone. Two of the geese immediately drop out to care for the sick or injured goose. They will stay with it until it recovers or dies and then rejoin a passing formation. A lesson learned, we should always care for our friends and loved ones when they are sick or are going through trouble. The Sun, located 93 million miles from planet Earth, diameter 865,000 miles, 109 times bigger than Earth, surface temperature 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit. If the Sun were any closer to the Earth, we would burn up, and if the Sun were any farther away, we would freeze. The Lord is amongst His infinite attributes, light and love. He is the source of light, love, life and all blessings. Matthew 5, 45, That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Matthew 13, 43, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew 17, 2, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. The moon reflects light from the sun. Christians reflect light from the Lord. Those who do not have the light of the Lord walk in darkness. The moon is one-fourth the size of the earth. The moon's distance from the earth is 250,000 miles. The moon's gravity helps control the ocean tides. The tides are actually cleaning the oceans. 
Without the tides, sea life and ocean plant life would die, leaving us without sufficient oxygen. The tides of the oceans do not overflow the seashore, nor do they become stagnant. God's care for us is infinite. His laws of nature are sure, just as are all His commands. Mark 13, 24 But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. Acts 2, 20 The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Revelation 21, 23 and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Rainbows. When you see a rainbow, it is after rain. The sun is always behind you, and the rain in front of you when a rainbow appears. So the center of the rainbow's arc is directly opposite the sun. Every person sees their own personal rainbow. When you look at one, you are seeing the light bounced off of certain raindrops. But when the person standing next to you looks at the same rainbow, they may see the light reflecting off other raindrops from a completely different angle. In addition, everyone sees colors differently according to light and how their eyes interpret it. According to the Holy Bible, a rainbow is the beauty and power of God's promise that He would never again destroy the world with a flood. A rainbow is heaven's promise and technicolor. The promises of God are sure. People accept the promises in different degrees. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Revelation 4.3 And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Revelation 10.1 and I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. No two snowflakes are exactly alike, though there is no scientific reason for this astounding fact. Every snowflake has six sides. Billions of snowflakes fall during even the shortest of snowstorms. The largest snowflakes ever recorded fell in Montana and were 15 inches in diameter. Lesson learned, God never makes duplicates. He only makes originals. Isaiah 1.18 Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Matthew 28, 3, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, His countenance was like lightning, and His raiment white as snow.